in John 17, again, while Jesus is praying that what is known as the high priestly prayer, and he's praying to the Father on behalf of us. And he says, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that's you and me, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. That's us. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and that you love them, even as you love me. Here it is again, John 15, John 17, there are other places. Take that word to heart, you are that loved. I in them and thou in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, even as thou hast loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, may be with me where I am. May be with Jesus where he is at the right hand of the Father. This is not pious language, it's reality. And it's when, let me just pause here and say, this is a talk on intercession. When we believe the word of God and we live out of who we are, we begin to take on his mind, his priorities, his agenda. We begin to see things with a different lens. And then when we pray, and we don't have to have it all down pat, we're never going to have it down pat. But as we move in that direction, more and more is God able to reveal to us what he most hopes for in another person or in a situation. And we learn how to pray according to the mind of God. And when we pray that way, our prayers are answered. It's really true. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is true. This is really true. In the family, Husbands should be praying for wives and wives for husbands daily. Together, you should be praying for your children. If you're the owner of a business, you should be praying for your employees. And your employees should be praying for you, but you start first. Or if you're an employee, ask others if you think they're open to pray for your employer. Pastors should pray for their parishioners. Other priests who are in other works of ministry, pray for those you serve. And the more you pray and the more you see fruit, the more they will ask you why and how, and then you will make of them intercessors for other needs for their families. It spreads. It's really true. Intercession standing before the face of the Father on behalf of someone with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't lose. It may take time, but you can't lose. Really. I know, you're sitting there saying, well, maybe it works for you because you're holy. Brothers and sisters, I have sinned much. And I have asked forgiveness much, many, many times. And God always forgives. I'm right there with you. But I know him as my father. I know him as my savior. Do you? Do you? See, that's, that's so important because when you know more and more, and that 
that happens as you progress. The more you know God is your Father and Jesus as your Savior, the more able you are to unite your prayer with Jesus before the face of the Father. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to inspire and to lead and to guide and to show us, and he will. But if you don't read the word, you don't even know what's possible. And that's why I'm saying 15 minutes a day. Some people can do more and should do more. I was very struck by a situation in a parish a number of years ago where the pastor was uh, of the parish uh, was pretty worn out. And um, things were very difficult in his parish and very hard. And it seemed that no matter what he did, it didn't help. And, and I'm sure he was more than discouraged. I'm sure he was depressed. And there were a small group of women who, you know, when women get together, they can be real warriors for God's plan, or they can end up just being gossipers, and gossip kills. We know it. But there was this group of women who decided that what they ought to do was pray for him. Instead of complaining, they should pray for him. And so they began to pray. They served, they did all kinds of things, they, they didn't push themselves on him, they just did all kinds of things. He turned and this was already done and that was already done. As the year went by, he, he, he recognized that these women were really serving him just quietly. And at the, uh, probably about March of that year, they came to him one time and they said, Father, we have a present for you. I, I don't know, it's five or six women, I think. They said, we have a present for you. And um, he said, what? And they said, we bought you a plane ticket to go to the priest conference at, at the University of Steubenville this summer. He tells the story, he said, I didn't want to go anywhere or do anything. But he said, these women have been so good to me and so good for the parish and had served so generously, I couldn't say no to them. So with some grumbling, he went to the priest conference. I happened to meet him at the priest conference with no knowledge of this background. And I met him on the first day of the conference and I just introduced myself and asked him how he was and he said, uh, I'm just going to get out of here, he said. I, I don't know why I came, but this group of women gave me this ticket so I came, but I don't, I, you know, I don't belong here, I, I don't want to be here, they're all singing and that's not where I am. And he, he was just, he was, he was discouraged and as I said, he was most probably depressed. Um, so I just prayed. I prayed he would stay. I had no idea there was a group of women praying for him, but I prayed. And I saw him two days later. Conference was not quite over, but I saw him two days later. And he was standing by the tent. In those days, all the conferences were outside, thousand priests. And I just happened to run into him as, as God ordains, you know. And I noticed that he looked like he had been crying. And I said, Father, I'm glad to see you stayed. Is there a, that you stayed? Is there anything I can do for you? And he looked up at me and he said, No, there isn't anything. He said, I'm, I'm very happy. He said, I had no idea. I had no idea who God really was. Here was a man who had given his whole life to God. And yet how easy it is for us, all of us, priests, bishops, sisters, lay people, married, single, children, all of us can so easily, so easily just get into the humdrum job of doing what I have to do and doing it day in and day out and saying all the right words, but somewhere the longest journey, as G.K. Chesterton said, that a man or a woman takes is the, in his measurement, the 17 inches from the head to the heart. It's the longest journey a man or a woman takes. I think it's shorter for me. For G.K. Chesterton, it was 17 inches, but he said that's the longest journey a man or a woman takes, that the truths 
the truths that you know, the truths that you've learned, the truths that you can parrot back, that those truths, once they get from here to here, they shape you, they shape your decisions, they shape your thinking, they shape your actions, they shape your words, they shape your dreams and your hopes, and they're intended to. It is a living word, and it has power to change your life. That priest's life was changed because a group of women prayed, and they prayed for the right things. We have a power, brothers and sisters, given us in baptism and confirmation that I don't think we've begun to use. But it does take discipline on our part. It does. It takes the discipline of saying, first things first, God should have my time this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, whatever works in your schedule, but you protect it. Start with 15 minutes if you don't have a regular prayer time. Read the scriptures. Read commentaries on the scriptures, but most of all, just say, Lord, let this word go from my head to my heart. Let what I'm reading here today touch my heart and change me. And if you do that, it honestly will happen. It honestly will happen because God loves you. And because God loves your family, God loves your spouse, God loves your children, God loves your parents, God loves the pastor of your parish and any other priests who are serving there. God loves them. And he wants you to become light in the darkness. He really does. Personally, for your family, your family becoming that within the parish, this is not just a pipe dream. It's a reality. God hears every word of every prayer we pray. Don't make your 15 minutes intercession or your half hour intercession. Make it time to get to know God, to know his word, to ask him for grace, to ask him for help. Let that time be for you and God. And then when you begin to pray for other situations, you begin to see differently. So make sure that you read the passages that I've quoted here. Romans 8, verses 26 to 27. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You see, when we pray, what we desire when we intercede, what we desire is, Lord, What's your will in this situation? What do you want to see accomplished? I know I've said this before, but I want to repeat it because I want you to get it. Lord, what do you want us to pray for? How do you want us to pray? For example, if you're praying for your parish, uh, there may be new uh, plans for the parish, you may be going through one of those mergers where there's lots of challenges and difficulties. You may be praying for all those things, and it's good to pray for them, do. But, but often, what is first in God's heart, unless God shows you something else, and he could, but what's first in God's heart is that everybody in that parish know him and know how loved they are by him. So the first thing to pray for is that the love of God may be rooted in their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see change. Won't come right away. Won't come the way you expect it. It might come just in a little, what we'd call a blip on the screen, but it grows. And it changes. You just keep on praying. Don't be, 
Don't be concerned if things seem to get worse or tougher, or if there's an issue in the parish and it just seems to get worse. Often things get worse before they get better. And you know why? I'll tell you why. When you pray, you are bringing the power of God to bear on a situation. And the enemy does not like that. The enemy often has a stronghold in our minds or in a family or in a grouping. He's some way, he's bound us together in hatred or anger or jealousy or envy or something. There's some stronghold of the enemy because the enemy goes after all of us. And so when you begin to pray into a situation, it often gets worse in the sense that it, it just, everything goes up a few notches. Whatever you were experiencing before increases in intensity. Don't stop praying. Oftentimes people do and they say, well, my prayer doesn't work. Look what happened. No, persevere. Persevere right through it. Just keep praying. And God will do his work. He will hear your prayer. Even though you think I'm only one person or I'm, I'm just, I'm nobody. When you go to the Lord, say to the Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Sorry for any ways that I've offended you. Please hear my prayer. You open the doors right away. That we come to know him and love him to a place where, Lord, I want your will more than I want my own. Now that's where it's hard, especially parents for their children, especially spouses for one another. We think we absolutely know what's best. Sometimes we do, but most of the time we have it a little bit skewed because we're so aware of whatever the circumstances are right in front of us that they need. They need relief from pain or help or whatever. And that's what we're focused on. But God sees the bigger picture. How can he use this situation to draw you or to draw the one you love closer to him? Because in the end, that's the best and the safest place to be is right in the center of God's will. I remember a time in my life, um, and quite a number of years ago, um, I was at Franciscan University at that time I was uh, we were working on the renewal of the campus there. And uh, I was talking to the Lord one day about what was his will in a certain situation. And I thought I knew what his will was and I wasn't very happy about it. So as I have often done and perhaps you have done, I was bargaining with the Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, you know, if, if you do this, then I'll be able to do that for you and I'll be able to do this for you. And I'm trying to convince God that my way is the best. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I have. And um, more and more I was being convicted by God that what was really going on here was I didn't trust him. That I trusted my ideas and my priorities and my way of approaching something more than I trusted and um, it was quite a realization, and I wasn't very happy about it, and I tried to excuse it, minimize it, but ultimately, day in and day out, circumstance by circumstance, I could begin to see that what was really going on in my life was that I was not trusting God, that he didn't love me enough or care for me enough or know these circumstances enough, because if he did, then he would do what I wanted him to do. When I look back on it, it sounds very childish, but I tried with every adult uh, cell in my brain uh, to come up with reasons why my way of handling this situation or that circumstance was better than anybody else's. And if God just cooperated with me, everything would be fine. It's called arrogance but, and pride. But at that time, it seemed very commonsensical to me. So after many, many weeks with this, I finally said to the Lord, and it was, a, it was a dangerous prayer, but it's a prayer that I repeat often now in my life. I said to the Lord, 
I do love you and I do want your will more than I want my own. I'm scared to say that. So whatever you need to do to change me, do it. I'll tell you what happened to me, and I, I tell it knowing that I might just scare you away from wanting God's will, but listen to me for the whole thing. About 30 seconds after I prayed that prayer, a car, I was driving home. It was snowing. It was uh, uh, early in the evening, and I was coming home, and as I passed a side street where there was a stop sign, the driver, who turned out to be drunk, uh, ran the stop sign and uh, plowed right into the door on the driver's side, right where I was, put my head through the window on the driver's side, and then threw me across to the other side, took the jaws of life, or whatever we call them, to get me out of that. Um, I had about a month of recuperation. I had lots of stitches, um, broken bones on my face. Um, and so it would, took a while before I could come out of all that pain and dealing with it. And I was right away arguing with God. Why did you let this happen? You've asked me to do this and do that, and now this has happened. And I really did sense, you can take this for what it's worth, but I really did sense the Lord himself walk into my room. I couldn't, no audible words, I saw nothing, but I knew his presence. And it was as though the Lord sat down beside me. And he said, I want you to listen to me. And then he talked to me about his love for the Father's will and about how he wanted me to have the same love for the Father's will that he had. It began uh, what I would call a very intimate time with the Lord over the next month while I recuperated. I cherish those days now. I cherish every bit of it and I was completely healed. There's no residual effects, which was amazing. But God used that because I don't think he could have gotten my attention any other way. And he taught me about how his father's will was the safest and the most beautiful, in a sense, place to be. I still wrestle. There are times when I say to God, I want to want your will, but right now I don't. I mean, even one time I said to the Lord, I want to want to want your will. I was getting back about three steps, but very quickly I can move toward trusting him because I saw what he did for me and I came into a depth of understanding of God's will and loving his will uh, more than I ever could, probably in any other way for me. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is be a sinner who knows who saves us. That's all you have to be. And one who gladly goes to him asking forgiveness. It takes humility. But oh my goodness, the treasures that God gives us when we, when we humble ourselves and say, I'm part of the problem that I'm praying for. I've contributed to the problem. I'm sorry. We pray like that, God hears us. God will hear your prayer. All he wants us to do is come to him. And when we come to him, the more we've read his word and the more that word is living within us, marvelous changes. Also urge you, uh, if you're praying for something in particular, as often as you can go to daily mass, there's no greater uh, act of prayer than the sacrifice of the mass to offer to God. You can do it that way as well. Not only that way, but certainly that's the highest form. Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, John Paul called adoration of the Blessed Sacrament radiation therapy. Your life will be changed. We, we pray and we don't see, but the radiance flowing from 
the life of Christ from the presence of God in the Eucharist can change our lives. It's really true. Use all those means and trust him. He will hear every word of every prayer you pray. Trust him. Let me close with this. A number of years ago, my father became very sick with um, kidney failure. And he was on dialysis for 10 years. Before he died, he suffered a great deal. And I prayed that God would heal him. Oh my goodness, I prayed. Please God, heal him. Because I've seen people healed. I've seen people miraculously healed. And I thought, I'll ask him. And so I just asked him, God, please, please heal, alleviate his suffering. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And my father bore his suffering marvelously. He really did. It wasn't easy at all, but he did. And I still kept praying for the healing, maybe this way, maybe that way. You know how we are. And on one very cold December night, in the middle of the night, my father died. Peaceful death. I know he's with the Lord, but there was still a lot of pain in my heart. And I remember leaving the hospital and getting into the car and saying to the Lord, remember, I said, Lord, I trust you that your way is better than my way. I trust you. But I said, in my weakness, Will you please give me a sign that he's with you? Because then all suffering is gone. And in one way, my prayer will be answered. It's the eternal healing. And I said, please. And then I said, Lord, just send me a shower of roses as he says, as a sign that he's with you. And I, I actually had to chuckle right then. I thought, well, that sounds like Therese of Lisieux. Never prayed that way before. It just came out of my mouth. Send me a shower of roses as a sign that he's with you. I didn't tell anyone. Three weeks later, I was coming home from work here in Ann Arbor. And uh, I was coming back to the house I live in with other sisters. And when I came to the door, there was a long floral box on the porch. And I thought, oh, I wonder who those are for. And there was no name on the box. And so I carried it inside and I thought, well, Whoever it's for, I better put these flowers in water because it would be a while before the other sisters came home. So I, I got out a vase and opened up the box. And inside was a dozen long-stemmed red roses. And there was a card uh, in the box. And honestly, this is what the card said. It was from uh, a couple in our parish who at the time I did not know. I knew their names, but I didn't know them personally. And the card said, God told us to send you these roses and to tell you that your prayer is answered 12 times over. God answered my prayer far greater I was looking simply with a finite view. God saw an eternal perspective. Ultimately, that's what we want for everyone we pray for, that they will be with him forever. And God gave me that treasured moment and the openness of another family to respond to a genuine inspiration. We always have to test them. Just every thought you get it isn't necessarily a genuine inspiration, but they had one. And they sent them flowers. And I will never forget it. Brothers and sisters, we have a hidden power, so to speak. We really do. We have a hidden power that we don't use. We need to learn how to pray in his name. That means according to his will. I'm repeating myself on purpose, asking God, what is your will in this situation? And asking yourself, what would God want here? And if you don't know, just say, Lord, I don't know how to pray, 
but I bring these prayers before you and I ask that you would fulfill your will in the best possible way. Sometimes we just have to pray that way. Sometimes God will give us a particular sense of how to pray. Brothers and sisters, there is a veritable powerhouse that would open in the life of the church, in the life of your parish, in the life of your family, and your workplace. If we took God's word to heart, if we really put our faith in him, if we gave him time personally every day so he could shape us and form us by his word into true disciples. As we're going through that process, we're never, there's no graduation, it's a lifelong process, but the more we move in that direction, the more we will sense his mind and his will in a situation. And how marvelous, how marvelous is the fruit of genuine intercession. I ask that God would bless you and lead you and guide you. Any questions, just deliver them to me. God bless you.